Artificial intelligence is taking over the world as we know it. ChatGPT, for one, has been able to take over schools everywhere, making professors fear that it can do their schoolwork easier, quicker, better than most students can, because it can summarize and even complete some tests for students. AI potentially also has the ability to take over the world of art, because nowadays you can even just write a prompt into the AI and it can generate many different artworks in the style of different artists if you suggest it, quicker than any artist can. But it also means that the algorithm has been fed by artists' work that might not have consented to it, leaving them potentially out of a job. However powerful AI actually is, People fear it because they don't know much about it. It has the potential to revolutionize massive parts of society, but as long as we don't know what its limits are, we might just ban it outright and not actually utilize it for the potential that it has. So, let's do what we do best. Let's explore AI, let's look at the limits, what it can possibly do, and maybe we can even find out why you will always be smarter than AI. First things first, AI stands for artificial intelligence, which is a different type of intelligence than ours. So it's different than our intelligence because it is artificial, it is something that is created in a machine. Our intelligence is also created by humans, so we have found IQ tests in order to measure the rate at which you pick up new concepts or learn new things, for example. But the tests that we use to get there are usually quite faulty and I'll link a video on there for someone else to explain that in detail because I can't go into it now. When in conversation with some very insecure people, they will start bragging about having higher IQ scores as if that does mean something. But we've also seen that you can prepare very well for an IQ test leading to higher scores by doing other IQ tests, for example. Ultimately, it's very difficult to say that the IQ test really prepares you for a quality that is outside in the world that we're trying to measure if you can practice for it by doing the same kind of tests and getting higher scores. But usually you don't have that argument ready. So what people usually do to deflect from the idea that someone is smarter because of their IQ, people start referring to their EQ, an emotional quotient, uh, emotional intelligence. We usually say that it's street smarts. Therefore, we try to include all kinds of people to say everyone is smart in their own way, which I agree with. And in that same vein of having other qualities that we refer to in order to get rid of the, the idea that intelligence is the most important part, is we think of qualities like cleverness and wisdom. So I thought it might be interesting to start looking into what the differences are between these words that we use to denote something like how uh, interesting the contents of your mind are. So we're going to look at intelligence, smartness, cleverness, and wisdom. What makes them different? And to analyze those differences properly, we're going to look at it in a way that you might not always do, dialectically. It's a very difficult word, but it basically means that something else has its meaning also in what it is not, its opposite. So being smart can mean something, but it has more meaning knowing also what its opposite is, being dumb. In the same way, when we talk about being intelligent, we say the opposite is usually being stupid. And then we can get sayings like, I might be dumb, but I'm not stupid. We'll get into that later. The importance of dialectical thinking is that the meaning gets enriched by knowing its opposite. Knowing what good is, is more powerful when you also know what evil is. Knowing what success feels like is very much more powerful knowing what it is like to fail. And in the same way, knowing what it is like to be unloved by everyone makes it so much powerful when someone actually comes up to you and tries to love you. So, let's start with intelligence. Intelligence is this human-made category that we made up. It's a social construct. It doesn't mean that it's fake. It does, however, mean whatever we say is smart or not smart, or whatever the points on an IQ scale mean, is completely arbitrary. And of course, not speaking about the legitimacy of the IQ test, intelligence is something that we try to apply to other than humans. We try to apply to birds, for example, and elephants, and compare animals depending on how intelligent they are. Again, the opposite of intelligence is stupidity. 
So we're trying to say intelligence is the how quickly you pick up new ideas, how quickly your mind can make connections in order to learn new things, allegedly. And stupidity then is the opposite, is being unable or very slow in making these new connections. According to Merriam-Webster, the definition of intelligence is the ability to use reason to understand and learn about new situations, or to apply knowledge to manipulate one's environment and think in categories like that are measured by objective criteria, abstractly. Both definitions here speak to the idea of learning, of creating new knowledge, of things that are true and a body of work. Intelligence here might be practical information, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be information. So when you look at the opposite of being stupid, we usually have this saying is I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. And what that then means is that I might not know a lot, but I am able to learn more. But just like the idea of being talented at stuff and that you cannot learn some stuff, but you can learn other stuff and being a quick and slow learner, recent research in learning theory actually have shown some very remarkable things that might suggest that we actually all learn at the same rate. Hold on, let me explain. I'm going to literally quote the results of the research then. Can anyone learn to be good at anything they want? Or is it talent? Having a knack for math or a gift for language required? Our evidence suggests that given favorable learning conditions for deliberate practice and given the learner invests effort in sufficient learning opportunities, indeed, anyone can learn anything they want. So let's explain the experiment a bit. How did they get to this conclusion? In short, what they did is they, they took children from all levels of education, from elementary to college level. They took different groups in different subjects, from math to languages, for example. And what they did is first, they had an entry level test to check whether they had the required level at their level to participate in the test. Well, once that was cleared, there was a test that they had to take. And once the test was done, we would check whether the students scored 80% or not. If the students scored 80% of above, they could stop and they would have completed the test. If they scored anything below 80%, they would have the opportunity to learn and retake the test later. So you would then want to know as a researcher, when someone of a higher education level uh, fails to get to the 80% at the first try, would it take them fewer tries to get to the 80% as someone from a lower level of education? If you then take all of these students, like thousands of students, you would think about learning rate. How many opportunities does someone need at, on average to get to the 80%? Because this process would repeat. Every time they would not get 80%, they could try again next time. So what they ultimately found, why it's so interesting, is that no matter the level of education, the number of opportunities that uh, people from higher education and lower education took to get to the 80% for their tests was roughly similar. Which means that the thing that is ultimately important is how much opportunity you have to learn something. You might not know anything about quantum physics at this point, but if you were to sit for it long enough, you could get to that point, absolutely. It is just that our society and our schooling system does not allow you to take the time that you need to understand something. And this also makes sense when we think about how the brain works and how learning works. Because when you are born, your brain doesn't have much of any connections of what things are connected to one another. And once you start learning, doing stuff and learning that some things are better or not and learning about new stuff, there will be new connections in your brain that are made. Effectively, learning becomes easier once you know more, because once there are many connections in your mind that you could relate new information to, you can start from an, well, a head start, as you say. If you already have a background in physics, for example, learning quantum physics is going to be much easier for you because you already have the framework present, but if you are a five-year-old, it's going to be very difficult because there are a lot of steps that you need to get through before you'll start understanding quantum physics. That would effectively mean that 
the starting point of knowledge is with the opportunities that you have to get to that level that you want to get are the most important factors in intelligence. Not whether you have talent, not whether you are inherently more intelligent. It has to do with, do you have the willingness or the ability to sit down and learn? And what was your starting point for learning something? But then our education system is not designed to give everyone the time they need to understand whatever they want, because we have this slow moving train that has to get all the passengers, no matter their level, to their end point at the same speed. That means that some people will not be challenged enough and will get bored of school and just not learn as much. And there will be some people for which the train will be go too quickly and they will drop out. But also it means that even when you are doing well in the middle of the train, it means that the things that you happen to be good at for whatever reason, for whatever prior knowledge you have and could learn it, you just keep those subjects and the things that you struggle with at the time, if the world doesn't allow you to uh, sit down enough to actually learn it, you're just going to specialize in the things that you are good at and drop the things that you are not good at. Effectively, if I was good naturally at things like languages and economics and stuff, and physics posed more of a challenge to me, I am incentivized to start just pursuing the things that I'm good at. So let's go to another point, being smart and its opposite being dumb because smartness is different from intelligence because it's not about how quickly you learn new things. Smartness is about using the knowledge you have and make it fit to the current situation. It could be coming up with completely different ideas in order to fit the situation. So the dimensions of smartness that are more important are is that it is relevant and that it is practical. A very smart person might just be able to use a very little amount of information and use it in many different ways. Think about having a hammer and being able to do lots of different things with it. And then dumb means that you are unable to apply the knowledge that you have to a current situation. Very intelligent people might just be very dumb because they have the idea that a hammer is just used to hammer nails and not understand the many different ways that you could use it. Wisdom, something very different, actually has more to do with experience. Wisdom is having experience and like adding all that up in a semi-codified manner, which means that it is not necessarily useful for other people. Like my experiences are not necessarily useful for other people, but having wisdom would mean that I understand how situations can mean many different things and apply the experiences that I've had, the lessons that I have learned and understanding which lessons are important at which time. Because experience is so important when it comes to wisdom, and that's why we say old people are usually quite wise, they've lived through a lot. The opposite of wisdom then is ignorance, the having no experience or the unwillingness to be open to experiences. It might seem very similar to being smart as being wise is because you know what to do in a certain situation. I think wisdom is older than that. Wisdom knows a lesson can go both ways. You can have the saying carpe diem, which means a seize the day, which focuses as being in the present. But in the same token, you have to say memento mori, remember that you'll die, as to remember that your actions right now have influence after you die. Both of these sayings can be used as wisdom, but a wise man is knowing exactly when which lesson applies, it is useful to say somewhat to someone. And so you have more of an understanding of the malleability of knowledge. You understand a bit more that knowledge itself can be used in many different situations. And it doesn't mean that one of them is correct at all times or and wrong at all times. And that something else is more superior at all times. But there is a danger to wisdom here because wisdom is best when it experiences new things all the time. But it can become quite stale if you have no experiences that are different than the ones you have. Therefore, you would just try to 
self-justifying of this is the way it's always been this is the way i've always known it but also new knowledge might pop up that it might not know what to do with and then just say well what i know is different and therefore i'm not going to accept the facts that have come to light now so wisdom is something that you will generate over time you'll naturally grow more wise as you have more experiences you know more about what to do in certain situations, what your possibilities are, and how you could weigh these different possibilities. So a wise person knows exactly when something new pops up, what to look for by its experience of the old. And then lastly, cleverness. Cleverness is the weirdest of these because it's very interesting. It means that it, you are quick. Your mind can respond quickly to things in original ways. So the dimensions that are most important to emphasize here is that cleverness means wit. It's that you are quick and original. So when we use clever is for example, we say to someone else when they had thought of something that you hadn't thought of, or when you are in a conversation and they made a funny comment off the cuff, that comment might not be as smart later on, but at that moment, we can think that it's clever. But as I've noticed, clever is always in the past tense, which means that only upon looking back at something, do we say that something is clever. We cannot say it in the future, and we usually don't say it proactively. Someone is not necessarily a clever person at all times. It means that something that someone did was clever. So cleverness only exists upon reflection, when you say it about something or someone else. And it means that the boundaries of my knowledge allow me to make someone else look clever at the time. If I already knew everything and I knew what they were going to say, I wouldn't say that it's clever. But because the boundaries of my knowledge, when someone else says something outside of that at that time, then I think it's clever. So what does all this mean? All these words mean when it comes to artificial intelligence, what it can do and what it cannot do. Well, artificial intelligence means then that it can very quickly create new patterns by learning lots of different things, process it, and then regurgitate basically the same thing in different ways back to you. Art AI, however, doesn't ever become wise because it cannot get experience. It can only ever use the information that it is fed to make patterns. And then sometimes you'll get into trouble because the patterns that it learns from the very limited information that it gets is either harmful or misleading or incomplete. But the patterns might seem very legitimate. That means that when AI will always be more intelligent than us, when it comes to processing speed and memory, they will always be better. They will always be able to do things quicker and remember more things than our brains can. The schoolwork wise, basic tasks such as memorization, summarization and recreation of stuff will best be taken up by the AI. And so the majority of the old school work can be done by AI. That is why it is so difficult to counter it or it's such a threat to professors that don't know how to design schoolwork that AI cannot do. AI, however, because it feeds on enormous amounts of data, it doesn't necessarily have the wisdom or smartness to know why data is relevant, how it got that way, and what it even means. You need humans to interpret that data. Think about a captcha test. So that, is this a cat? Look, click all of the pictures that are cats. Usually you think this is quite easy, but the AI cannot distinguish what a cat is. So it's going to be trained by you responding to it saying, look, these are these different pictures are different cats and then remembers that. And the next time that picture comes up, it will remember that it's a cat. But usually with these kinds of capture tests, a cat will be in many different poses. The same picture could be rotated slightly and the AI doesn't necessarily know that that would be a cat. It could become smarter because humans can program that you have to look out for these things, for example, that it has a tail and it has whiskers and it has these kinds of colors and these kinds of breeds. But still, the AI doesn't necessarily know what it's looking at it can only compare what it's looking at to the other things that has been confirmed to be cats 
Again, AI doesn't know exactly why things are the way they are. They can get huge data sets, but they completely depend on what data they are fed. If, for example, you would give them the data set from a Norwegian prison with people that are only six, over six foot and blonde, it might conclude that, hey, if this is what a prison is and it has no other reference material, that prisoners are blonde and are over six foot. So if you then give them the data from another prison entirely, of, uh, for example, Mexico, it might not register exactly what it is looking at. It cannot know. Or when you give them data of, hey, this is the prison population of the United States over time, it can say, okay, these are what patterns are. Like I learned something about the people that are in there and why they are in there for, but it cannot know why it happened that way. So you need humans for that to form a theory, interpret the data and test that theory of, hey, is this the reason why? Is the present population of these kinds of people higher because in the 90s a crime bill was introduced that made it easier to arrest people for minor stuff? When you look at that spike then, humans can understand what the data mean, but the AI cannot. So AI can at best ever find a heavy correlation. It can show that some factors in the data set are connected, but it can never show why it is that way of what is the causation also because the ai is just fed data by humans it cannot know exactly which sources of data are more worthwhile or less worthwhile and you will not solve this problem by just giving it all the data think for example of all the news that is available on a celebrity when you think about what is true probably most news that is reported about celebrities comes from gossip mags and gossip mags are things that we as humans know are completely full of shit. They are things that try to use clickbait or a very heightened reality uh, paparazzi pictures in order to create narratives, get people to buy their magazines, but usually have very little to any information about what is true. Like who's dating who, for example. But if you then ask the AI to gather all the information that is out there on Taylor Swift, for example, and it would take much of the data from these gossip mags, it might make patterns or conclusions that are not true because the AI cannot know which sources of information are worthwhile or are not. There are many humans that cannot even distinguish that. And of course, that is a political question, but the AI is just looking at the raw data and you would need someone uh, behind the scenes to determine this is useful, this is not useful. And I'm not saying that some types of information are just always true and some things are never true. Like there are scientific journals that publish complete nonsense from time to time or studies that are fabricated with uh, FP hacking that just make it seem useful research. But generally speaking, scientific journals are way more credible than gossip mags are. But that is on your judgment. A humans can make that judgment, can look at what went into the AI, what went into the decision of being worthwhile or not, and make up their own minds. This is all important because all the other words that we talked about, other than intelligence, being smart, clever, and wise, are things that the AI can never take over. However, our world is so obsessed with intelligence and these boring tasks of summary, memory, and regurgitation that lots of people do stand to lose their jobs if AI were to be introduced there. But that shouldn't be the case. Not because AI shouldn't be there, because only capitalism can find a way to make having less work that is stupid actually be a bad thing, because people will be on the streets. We should then create a world where the qualities that are uniquely human, like being clever, smart, or wise, or even things like compassion, things the AI cannot do, are more valued. People can be appreciated for those qualities and not by the simple things that the AI can take over. Besides, what is beautiful is something that is only there between humans. We appreciate beauty within a culture which is different than other cultures. And it is different between AIs because AIs don't care about beauty because it's not an objective quality. And because of that, creativity 
and judgment are so uniquely human that they cannot be taken over by AIs. So when you fear that the AI has the ability to replace you, you have to look at it more like that Wikipedia has the potential to replace the old grand masters and these large tomes of knowledge when it comes to storing the knowledge of humanity, but it didn't effectively make the world worse. Applying knowledge outside of its usual context is again very human and we can only appreciate the beauty that it can form. So whereas AI can be useful in, think about building bridges, in designing bridges with the ideas in mind that it has to be over this certain lake, it needs to have this kind of budget, it needs to be inspired by these kinds of artists, the AI can think of many different ways to form that bridge, but ultimately only humans can pick which bridge they want to build. Finally then, if our world and our system are designed to have people be retainers of information, just simply, then AI can just take it over and we'll all be homeless. However, if we design a world and systems where creativity, cleverness, wisdom and smartness are actually valued, then we might actually use AI to boost human potential beyond what we were ever able to do. So instead of just fearing AI, think of all the ways that having the intelligence part be taken away can actually make the creativity part way quicker, way better, and see where that takes us. Because ultimately, I believe in a world where we can unleash human potential and human creativity, and currently the world is not suited for it. So then we might need to limit AI. But it isn't necessarily just a bad thing. Just use the tool in the right situation. And that's a wrap for another one. I hope you understood and liked, especially the exploration of the words like we usually do, because there will always be things that you will have that AI cannot replicate you for. Of course, besides you being stunningly gorgeous, that is. The AI has lots of things that we could use and we should try to envision a world that we can actually use the AI to its fullest potential without feeling the need to go homeless for it. So I'll end with the last question. Have you ever used AI and in what ways do you think it has potential to change society? And if that's all, um, if there's nothing further, I'd love to see you in the next one.